the message this morning, uh, we're looking at John 19, the very last part of John 19, and we've seen the death of Christ, the crucifixion, and now what we're going to look at today deals with what's done with his body afterwards. And it seems almost like an afterthought. Why do we need to hear details about what happened to Jesus' corpse? Literally, that's what we're going to look at today. But if we look at history and what John was having to deal with as an author and as a pastor after Christ's death, there were groups that came along like the Gnostics. If you remember, you've, you've probably studied and you remember the Gnostics were a group, they were heretics by the way, they were cast out of the church because they believed that the way to connect with God was through this mysterious higher knowledge that you could connect with God and they were real obsessed with the divine but gave very little importance to the tangible flesh, the world around them. And so they believed easily that Jesus was divine, that he was God incarnate, but not the incarnate part. <coughs> they didn't believe about that he was fully man. So they could accept one side. The Docetists were similar to the Gnostics. They believed that Jesus seemed like a man, but really was just divine and, and appeared to be a man. So the death on the cross didn't connect with either of these groups, the Gnostics or the Docetists. Today, we don't see the, the, the Gnostics or the Docetists. They don't have places of worship. But we see the undercurrents of those beliefs in other groups. Give you a prime example. Islam wants to deny the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because that's what everything hinges on for Christianity. So they would say that Jesus, he, he merely fainted on the cross and was placed in the tomb, and in the coolness of the tomb, he came back to life somehow, or he awoke. Um, these are some of the absurd explanations that discredit the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. What John wants to do in our text this morning is assert on many different levels, secular and sacred, that Jesus very physically died. He died a bodily death, and he wants to certify that beyond the shadow of a doubt in our hearts and minds and for the world. So he's going to give us three groups that attest to the fact that Jesus physically died. And then, of course, in the coming weeks, we're going to see that he's going to attest to the physical bodily resurrection as well. But we're going to focus on the, the, the physical death. Uh, as we know, if Jesus didn't physically die, we're all still in our sins. Because Jesus, as the perfect sacrifice, had to be completely God and completely man, meaning that he needed to die physically as a man to atone for our sins, to be the perfect blood sacrifice that would once and for all cover all of our sins. So we're going to see what is the importance of what happens to Jesus' corpse after the crucifixion. Um, we're going to see why John gives a detailed account of what happens to Jesus' body after his death. And we're also going to see that pagans, believers, and God's word itself all attest to the physical bodily death of Jesus. So let's read through. It's not a, a particularly long passage, about 10 verses. John 19, 31 through 42. Then, because it was the day of preparation... So that the body should not stay on the crosses on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was an especially important one, the Jewish leaders asked Pilate to have the victim's legs broken and the bodies taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men who had been crucified with Jesus, first the one and then the other. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and blood and water flowed out immediately. And the person who saw it has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may also believe. For these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not a bone of his body, not, not, not a bone of his will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. 
Pilate gave him permission, and so he went and took the body away. Nicodemus, the man who had previously come to Jesus at night, accompanied Joseph, carrying a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 75 pounds. Then they took Jesus' body and wrapped it with the aromatic spices and strips of linen cloth, according to Jewish burial customs. Now at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb where no one had yet been buried. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they placed Jesus' body there. So let's do a quick, quick review of John. Just to give us a reminder of the context. If you remember, John is the gospel of belief. And all through everything John says in his gospel, his goal is to point us to childlike faith in Jesus. He wants to convince us that Jesus is the only way. So everything he's saying is to point us to that one thing. Now, if you remember the first 12 chapters were Jesus' public ministry, all the miracles, all the awesome stories that we share in Sunday school. And then begins the private ministry. And he starts with the upper room discourse where he's talking to his disciples. And then there's the high priestly prayer where he prays that amazing prayer. And then the road to the cross. And that's where we are. He's just been crucified. And now we're dealing with what's going to happen with his body afterwards. So we're going to hear first from the pagans. The pagans will attest to the fact that Jesus died bodily, physically. We're going to hear certainty from the pagans. So let's, let's go back and think about some of the context. And because it was the day of preparation, so that the body should not stay on the crosses on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was an especially important one, the Jewish leaders asked Pilate to have the victim's legs broken and bodies taken down. So this preparation, the Friday before the Sabbath was the day of preparing because it, they couldn't cook on, on the Sabbath because they couldn't work. So everything had to be done on Friday. If you remember, for the Jews, the day was sundown to sundown. So the preparation day was sundown Thursday to sundown Friday, and the Sabbath would be sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. So uh, this was a particularly important uh, Sabbath because it was the Sabbath that fell on Passover. Remember when they were remembering uh, what God had done many years before as they were about to flee Egypt. And some context about the crucifixion, because uh, the Jews are asking for the legs to be broken to speed things up, a crucifixion could last days. If it was a particularly strong man who hadn't been flogged in a particularly difficult, hard way, he might last a couple of days on the cross, living, suffering. It was a treacherous way to die. Um, and then the bodies oftentimes were left on the crosses to rot, and the vultures would come and pick them dry. And this, for the, for the Romans, was a publicity. They left them out for all the passers-by to see. This is what happens to those who cross the Roman state. Don't do it. So they would leave the bodies to rot, and this gruesome sight was often left. If they didn't have another crucifixion lined up, they would leave the bodies out there. Um, so the Jews are saying, they, they uh, asked Pilate specifically to have the victim's legs broken, um, uh, let's look at why they want to speed up this process, get the bodies off the cross. Because there's something in their law from back in Deuteronomy. If a person commits a sin punishable by death and is executed and you hang the corpse on a tree, his body must not remain all night on the tree. Instead, you must make certain you bury him that same day for the one who is left exposed on a tree is cursed by God. You must not defile your land, which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So the Jews, according to their scriptures, shouldn't leave a, a criminal hung or... The Jews didn't crucify. They, they, in this case, were using hanging. But they weren't to leave the body on the, on the wood overnight. It was just a, it was just a thing. You, you buried them. So the Jews don't want the land, this special Sabbath, to be defiled by leaving these bodies hanging up the way that they would hasten a crucifixion would be to take iron mallets and break the legs of the prisoners. Because the, the prisoners would push up with their legs to make room for them to breathe, because they're hanging. If their legs were broken, all the weight fell on their arms, and very quickly the arms would run out of energy, and they would, they would suffocate. That was what the Jews, how nice, right? 
We want you to hasten the death of these criminals so that we can have our feast and not be defiled. Think about the irony. The Jews were worried about some of the finite things of their law. They didn't want to violate their Sabbath while they're murdering the Son of God. They're worried about, oh, we can't have the bodies hanging up there because we have a special Sabbath while they have hung the Son of God on the tree. This crazy irony in this. They're worried about the wrong things, the wrong preoccupations. So let's look at the certainty we get from these pagans, these Roman soldiers, in the next couple of verses. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men who had been crucified with Jesus, first the one, then the other. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Um, Let's remember that these guys... These Roman soldiers are professionals in death. They spend their lives, this squad of four, all they do is kill people. They know how to kill people. They know death. Death is their business. These guys are professionals in death. We probably can trust them to be able to identify a dead man because that's all they do. You think about the routine things that you do in your own job, You know them inside and out. You could do them in your sleep because you've done them so many times. It's the same thing for these Roman men. They know a dead body when they see it. And so they're doing this evil deed of clubbing these guys' legs. They they hit the two guys on the side, and they come up to Jesus and go, "Eh, he's dead. They don't want to do any extra work, right? You don't want to do something you don't have to do. So they don't, okay, he's dead. We don't have to club his legs. All right, let's move on. So they recognize that Jesus is already dead. No life in his body. There's no need to break his legs. So that's the first thing. The professionals identify death. These are pagans. They have no interest in supporting Jesus' claims to be the son of God. They don't want to help Jesus. This is just a fact of life for them. And then it says, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and blood and water flowed out immediately. So we don't really know exactly why they pierced Jesus. It probably was just a final verification. They probably were just wanting to be, okay, let's be completely sure. So they jab a spear up into his side. There are lots of medical explanations for why blood and water came out. Typically, a dead person doesn't bleed because there's no pumping pressure to push blood out. But what likely would have happened was that the liquid part in the red uh, blood cells had separated and had begun to pool in his chest cavity. And so they pierce him and gravity just the separated clear fluid from the red blood cells came out and they saw water and blood as best John could describe. So the doctors have said, this is also a very good sign that Jesus is dead. And likely they probably pierced his lungs and heart as well. So if there was any doubt, it's very clear now that Jesus is absolutely and completely bodily dead. So one more proof of death here. And there there have been a lot of different speculations as to the symbolism. What does the water and the blood coming out mean? We don't know. And anything we suggest is really just conjecture. We don't know if there's special symbolism behind the water and the blood, other than we know that it was a, another proof that Jesus bodily died. So the pagans, these Roman soldiers, are an excellent attestation to the fact that Jesus is physically dead. And then we see the next certainty from God's word. And the person who saw saw it, has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may also believe. We know it's John, the person. We know he always refers to himself in the third person, kind of veiled. He's speaking about himself. John's saying, and the person who saw it has testified. He's an eyewitness. He's saying, I watched them stick Jesus. I watched the blood in the water. This isn't a second hand or third hand account. He's saying, I was there. I saw it. I'm testifying to something that I was there for. And um, 
The goal, again, in everything that, that John is sharing here, as he says, so that you may believe. He's saying, I'm giving you these details as one more proof to point you to childlike faith in Jesus. And he tells us this at the end of the book. Now, Jesus performed many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these, meaning everything else in the book of John, are recorded so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is John's purpose in everything he's telling us. It's the gospel of belief. So he goes on and gives us references in Scripture that authenticate and verify the events that have just happened in the way that they happened. So he's going to cite the Old Testament. For these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled, not a bone of his will be broken. This looks back to Passover, a fulfillment of this scripture back in Exodus. It must be eaten in one house. You must not bring any of the meat outside the house, and you must not break a bone of it. They're talking about the Passover lamb. So think about Passover, the story of Passover. Um, God was about to free his people from the Egyptians, and uh, basically he tells them, you take this perfect lamb, slaughter it, put the blood of the lamb over your doorposts. And then eat this, eat this lamb with your family. Don't break its bones. Go to sleep, and the angel of death will pass over your home because of the blood that you place there. The symbolism that these are the covenant people with God. These are God's people. And the Egyptians will be struck. The firstborn will die. And that's what happened. So John is pointing back and saying, the Passover lamb... You couldn't break its bones. This was God's command to his people. Who is the true Passover lamb? Jesus. It wasn't by chance that Jesus chose when he gave up his spirit. He knew that the Jews were going to ask Pilate to speed things up and club the bones. Jesus had sovereignly planned, knowing that he needed to pass away beforehand so that they wouldn't break his bones, so that he could fulfill the scripture as the perfect Passover lamb. So this is the scripture that Jesus fulfills. They weren't to break the bones of the Passover lamb that they had just slaughtered, and the Passover lamb of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, his bones were not to be broken either, and they weren't. So Jesus fulfilled that scripture. And then John goes on, he says, and again, another scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. So Jesus is pierced by the soldier. We're not sure why, other than a verification. The pagan did it. It wasn't like he had any interest in fulfilling scripture. He was following the course of God's sovereign will, preordained. Let's look in Zechariah which scripture it is. I will pour out on the kingship of David and the population of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look to me the one they have pierced. Huh. Okay. And then we see another, another scripture that speaks specifically as a prophecy for the future. This is John in Revelation. Look, he is returning with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. This will certainly come to pass. Amen. So we see a, a past fulfillment in that Jesus, they were looking upon Jesus who, had been, who they had pierced, and then we know in the future when Jesus comes again, they will look on him who they pierced. Jesus is the one who they pierced. So Jesus fulfills this scripture as well. So God's word attests also to the details of his death. And then the final certainty that John gives us is from two believers. And we know these guys as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. So looking at verse 38, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he went and took the body away. So let's think a little bit about Joseph of Arimathea. We know he was a member of the, the Sanhedrin, which is that high, high council of the Jews, very important man, which meant he would have been rich and a man of 
significant power within his own culture. Okay? Um, the scriptures tell us that he was a secret disciple, which means that he was a genuine believer in Jesus, but kind of kept it under wraps. Um, we know that he stood out against the condemnation that the Jews had passed on Jesus. So he had stood up in that regard. And we know it says that scriptures say that he was a man who was waiting for the kingdom. He was a spiritually sensitive man. He wasn't as hard-headed as the other uh, Sanhedrin members. We have to think before we quickly say, why was he a secret disciple? Why wouldn't he be public about that? If he gets excommunicated for supporting Jesus, his life comes to an end, functionally. He would be ejected from the Sanhedrin, ejected from the Jewish nation. He would lose his wealth, his position and authority, and his job. He would have nothing if he were to come out for Jesus. So it was a really big deal for him to do that. So he hadn't up to this point. He had believed in Jesus. He was a saved man. But he hadn't openly professed. But what we see is that Jesus' death marked a significant change for Joseph. He began to openly confess Jesus. He goes to, to Pilate and asks for Jesus' body. We don't really know what the consequences were that he paid. We don't know what this cost him, but we can imagine. Some background on the bodies of men who were insurgents, who were um, uh, rebels against the Roman state. Um, they, as we saw earlier, were either left to rot, eaten by the vultures, or if they had to quickly take them down for another execution, they would throw them in a pit, in a common grave. No honor in that. And the other thing was their families couldn't claim the bodies. They couldn't give them a, a, a more honorable uh, burial because of, of what they had committed against the state. A state. So... Pilate, it's strange that he gives Jesus his body because Jesus was considered an insurgent, a rebel against the, the Roman state. That was why he was killed according to the Romans. So it's strange, maybe not strange in God's providence, but strange to the secular ear, why would Pilate give the body of an insurgent over to his friends to be buried in a proper way, in a Jewish way at that? Maybe Pilate had some regrets because he knew Jesus was innocent. Maybe Joseph's... Uh, power as a man of the Sanhedrin convinced him or maybe he just wanted to poke and humiliate the Jews more I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Jesus a proper burial now I'm going to poke the bear a little more because all of what Pilate was doing was to humiliate the Jews because he hated them they had forced, Jesus, forced his hand at crucifying Jesus and now he wants to do everything he can to poke them and humiliate them and I was reflecting, thinking about um, Joseph of Arimathea. It's something I think we should, we should all reflect on, what this scripture suggests we should reflect on, is we need to ask ourselves the question, are we sometimes secret disciples of Jesus? Have we, we trusted him, but does every sector of our lives, does it openly confess Jesus? Do all of my colleagues... Do all of my family members, do all of my, my friends, my, my friends at school, does every sector of society know that I follow Jesus? And I'm not saying we need to be obnoxious and in people's face and thumping them with, you know, big leather Bibles, but do they all know that we're followers of Jesus? Have we been secret disciples in, in certain sectors of our hearts and our lives? Or have we been open not obnoxious, but open about who we are with Jesus, that we're followers of Jesus. Do we share openly when the, when the opportunity comes or do we shrink away? These are questions that all of us wrestle with. It's not, I'm not saying this is an easy thing. Um, we need to wrestle with this. So the challenge is, Lord, help us to unmask our true identity in Christ with every realm and sector of our lives, everyone we come in contact with. And that when those opportunities come up to uh, compromise, and they come up and work in Italian workplaces a lot, Italians are regularly asked to falsify or lie on the, on the job. 
That's, it's, a, it's a very common cultural sin, deception in Italy. And it's regular, regularly asked in, in the workplace. And those are opportunities where we could say, no, I can't. I'm a follower of Jesus. I can't do that. And it may be costly, but yet another way we can openly proclaim our faith in Jesus. This was something that came up in John 12. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess Jesus to be the Christ so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved praise from men more than praise from God. They were believers among the ruling class that had trusted in Jesus but weren't open about it because they wanted the approval of men more than God's approval. And we have the same temptation in a different way. It's not quite the same in our world, but we have many temptations to be secret disciples, to be quiet and hush-hush about we've trusted in Jesus, we follow him, he is our Lord and our Savior. And it's just a chance for us to reflect how can we be open and clear disciples that share who we are in every sector of our, of our lives. So that was Joseph. Now he shares a little bit about Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the man who had previously come to Jesus at night, accompanied Joseph, carrying a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 75 pounds. So this is the third time we see Nicodemus and John. The first time was, of course, when Jesus is trying to explain you need to be born again. And Nicodemus was like, what? Do I have to get in my mother's womb again? So he was confused. And then we see the second time Nicodemus comes up in the book is when he is publicly defending Jesus among the Sanhedrin. And then this is the third time. So he was also a type of secret disciple who now is maturing and becoming very public with his faith. So it seems that Joseph and Nicodemus had gotten together and they had divided the tasks. We're going to give Jesus a proper burial. Joseph did the bureaucratic stuff with Pilate, right? He's getting the permission to get the body. And Nicodemus did the practical stuff. Let me get the linens and the spices, everything that's needed to actually do the burial preparation. So they divided their tasks. This myrrh and aloe would be probably uh, in a powder form, and they would uh, wrap it with, with the strips of cloth or with a single cloth folded over to dry the body out and also cover the odor. They didn't do embalming like, like we did, you know, draining the fluids and putting something else in, or like the Egyptians did where they would remove all the organs. The Jewish custom was just to wrap the body that it would dry out and not stink. Um, this quantity of myrrh and aloe that Nicodemus brought gives us an idea that he probably was quite wealthy, but also that he had a great love for Jesus, that he desired to give Jesus the best burial that they could, given the time that they had. Um, in verse 40, it says, then they took Jesus' body and wrapped it with the aromatic spices and strips of linen cloth, according to Jewish burial customs. These men just wanted to honor Jesus. Jesus had just been humiliated in the most grotesque way, naked on a cross, his body torn apart. They wanted to do what they could to honor their king, to give him a proper burial according to the, the custom of the Jews. Um, and it's a little ironic, too, that a Sadducee and a Pharisee are the ones giving Jesus a proper burial. It's a little ironic that his closest friends... His mother, they're not the ones doing it. It's a Sadducee and a Pharisee that have come to faith and arguably, indirectly, Pilate who conceded for them to be able to do it. A little bit of irony there. If you remember, all of Jesus' um, disciples had, had said, even if I must die with you, I will never deny you. But yet, none of them are present to do this, this very humble deed of preparing his body. It's God had appointed a Sadducee and a Pharisee to do this work. And it tells us a little bit about where it happened. Now, the place where Jesus was crucified there was a garden. And in the garden was a new tomb where no one had yet been buried. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, the tomb was nearby. They placed Jesus' body there. So, this was likely a private garden that would have a caretaker, uh, would have some type of uh, fence. It wasn't an open cemetery. It was likely a hewn-out 
they had excavated a cave in some limestone, and we know from, from, from history, historical documents, that it belonged to Joseph. So this is probably a wealthy man's tomb, and it is unique that it was a, a virgin tomb in the sense that no other person had been laid in. Usually families would be buried together in a tomb. So this set the stage for the resurrection, that when Jesus rose again, there would be nobody present in the tomb because Jesus was the only one who had been laid there. And these men had to work very quickly because Jesus died about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They had to get permission, get all these logistics together, and get him buried before the sun goes down. Um, now, we know that they would also be contaminated. They couldn't really participate in the Sabbath because they had touched a dead body. So they're already making sacrifices. The other thing that we, uh, we find, looking at the written records of the Jews in this time, we don't see any mention of a Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus, which likely means that they were excommunicated that their names had been struck from any record of the Jews, they probably paid a very high price for this outward support and love shown to Jesus. Um, we don't know for certain, but it's very likely that they paid the highest of prices for this. So even these two believers attest to the fact that Jesus was dead. They would have never embalmed and laid someone alive in a tomb. That was unthinkable, especially their own king, right? So even these believers are attesting to the fact that Jesus was physically dead. So we've seen pagans, these Roman soldiers, clear picture, Jesus is dead. The scriptures attest to the events, the way Jesus died, the way his body was treated after death. And now here are two believers that have certified to us as they've embalmed, in a sense, and entombed the body of Jesus that he is physically dead. So we, as believers, don't struggle to accept the historical fact that Jesus Christ bodily died. But this is vitally important that he would bodily resurrect. If he didn't bodily die physically and bodily resurrect physically, we're lost. But because he did both bodily die and resurrect, we're saved. And we know that he sits at the right hand of the Father. He is alive today. And again, the question for us is, what will we do with this Savior? I think all of us are believers here. We can reflect, will we be clear and bold disciples that are open about who we are, or will we be secret disciples? It's a daily choice that we make. Let's think about it and reflect on that. And be encouraged by this uh, example from Joseph and Nicodemus to come out where perhaps we have been in the dark about our faith. Let's pray. God, I thank you for clear, clear examples of how we know that Jesus physically died. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, historically, this is a fact. We worship you that this important element is true, that John's testimony is faithful. God, we know that because Jesus physically died as the perfect God-man, and he physically rose again as the perfect God-man, we know that his sacrifice was efficacious, that it was valid, and you accepted it, and that by faith, we can take part in what Jesus did and be cleansed of our sins. Thank you for that. God, would you help us, enable us in every facet of our lives to be clear and open about who we are, that we're followers of Jesus and we're not ashamed of that. Would you let us count whatever cost it is? Not that we would be obnoxious, but Lord, that we would be clear about whose we are and our new identity in Christ, that it would be an open and it would be an example to those around us who would draw them to faith in Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.